I went on stage in uh, Hilton Head with uh, Hootie and the Blowfish way oh, yeah. back when they were became big, and yeah. uh, so they invited right after we won the cup in '94, actually uh, at the old post office. And uh, so, Mark, come on up. It's kind of a college <laughs> yeah. bar back then. It was kind of uh, they get up there and they uh, give me a tambourine. So there I am. Banging the tambourine against my, and they, they gave me a plaque. <laughs> Mark tambourine messy. <laughs> Welcome back to Club 30, everyone, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. 24. Here we go. Let's go. Are you ready for a new year? I am ready. I am very excited. New chapters are everywhere. Anything specific you look forward to in the new year? I love to just think about the process of kind of starting again, you know, and continuing, obviously. But there's so much that's going to be new. There's a lot of things that you don't anticipate. Uh, so those challenges, like what they're going to be and how to get ready for them. How about you? I look forward to some trips. Yeah. Uh, hopefully some skiing. Um, I look forward to um, do more work around the garden. And uh, the Madison Square Garden, but also my garden, maybe back home at the <laughs> yeah. beach house. Who knows? You are quite a green thumb, Hank. <laughs> I have seen the I've beach seen. house. You know what I love when I go back to my beach house in Sweden? I love watering. I, I've it seen. It gives me peace. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to have to wait a few months before that. Um, all right. Start of 24. Last episode of this season. Yeah. And we're bringing on. A big guy. A big guy. <laughs> so big they called him Moose. <laughs> <laughs> or the captain. Or the captain. The captain. Number 11, Mark Messier is joining us today. Uh, growing up, uh, your opinion on Mark? Uh, I was obviously a huge Oilers fan just because of the dynasty in the 80s. Um, uh, everybody loved Wayne, but you know Mark was actually my kind of childhood hockey hero. Uh, just the way he played the game. Um, I, I don't think I back then I had the words to describe it, but it, just the way he was able to orchestrate like teams around him for so, so long was, was impressive. And obviously, uh, he's a big part of New York Rangers history too. Yeah, I, I was lucky enough to, to play when they retired number 11 at the Garden. Yeah. And just the impact he's had on hockey, but especially on, on New York and, and the New York Rangers. Yeah. Like number 11, the captain. I'm super excited. Yeah. Uh, so let's bring in Mark Messier for, for this episode. And uh, we have a lot to get into. So uh, let's go. He's an all-time NHL legend, a six-time Stanley Cup champion, and someone who probably hasn't paid for a drink in New York since 1994. <laughs> Welcome to Club 30, number 11, the captain, Mark Messier. Great, great to be here at Club 30. Club 30, thanks for being here, Got a good, got a good ring. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Um, I saw you a couple of months ago out in Vegas. We had a great time, uh, opening of the Sphere. What was your reaction to that show? I was uh, actually blown away. I expected great things because of everything I've heard about it. You never really know what it's going to be like until you're actually there. Yeah. And to experience the music, obviously, because of you, I'm a big U2 fan. But but to experience something like that, uh, the immersiveness of the of the Saphir, um, it was incredible. And I kept thinking I was going to take a bunch of pictures, and, but by about the 30 minutes into it, I said, "It's never going to do it justice." Yeah, I just got to tell my friends and my family, just come here yourself, and 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 do yourself a favor. It's and that different, it, huh? It's well, it's just the whole. It's just the whole experience, uh, the music, obviously, but the, the way this, uh, the, the screen brings it to life. Um, it's hard to explain, actually. Yeah. You know, Are you it, a music guy? I'm a huge music guy, yeah. Big, Len big. Favorite bands? Well, U2 was one of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have so many. Um, grew up with uh, Neil Young, obviously, and uh, just the uh, hip. just saw him at a the, tragically hip, too, of yeah. course. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But uh, big, uh, I would say more rock and roll. Uh, so you, but, go, uh, you go to a lot of shows? I do. Pretty yeah. much seen everybody over the last, uh, you know, 40 years or more. Started my first concert ever was uh, Fleetwood Mac in oh. uh, when I was, I think I was 16 years old. And then, no, I was 15 years old in Edmonton and then followed by Supertramp. Those are my first two concerts. Nice. It was amazing. Uh, <laughs> That's and they're legendary bands. But um, yeah, no, I've been a huge music fan and for, uh, for, the, the, for, the, for as long as I can sound, remember. The sound at the sphere, it's so well, clear. 
that's uh, so when you appreciate music for that ex- i mean you have the screen like you talked about but the, the quality of the sound is just incredible huh. and we're sitting you know right middle mid screen because it's so yeah. massive yeah we're so what is mid- the layout of the seats like what does it look like inside well think of radio city hall uh-huh. with a massive screen right oh wow right and uh four times the size easily wow. Easily, so it's it's a uh, huh. it's a lot to take in. It's I mean, a yeah. the full experience. Well, I, so I went back you the get next vertigo night. or anything. Yeah, I, no, I never felt. No, like not, someone said you might feel a little dizzy and all. Yeah. I never felt anything. Oh, it was just, huh. yeah. I went back the next night, two nights in a row. Right. It was oh yeah. I would I would have gone a week straight. Cool. Was what was amazing. your first concert? I mean, my first ever concert. Yeah. Ooh. Putting on the spot here. I don't. I've honestly don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember the well, first was, concert. Yeah. I'm, my mine was easy because everybody had a crush on Stevie Nicks. So yeah, that was course. easy. When I was 15 <laughs> yeah. years old, right? So mine was actually you two at the Exhibition Center in Toronto. Oh, right? that's that's a good one. Yeah. So music, uh, much like sports, it makes you feel different emotions, and and uh, I think that's part of why I love music as well. But I wonder what you when you walk into Madison Square Garden today, how do you feel? Oh, she said. Yeah, that's uh, that is flooding back a ton of memories every time I walk in there. Obviously, uh, just the feeling that I had every time walking in there, uh, the expectations, the excitement, the possibilities, the disappointments. I mean, everything that encompasses being on the biggest stage in the world. Um, and to this day, I, those memories are so seared into my consciousness that it's like a immediately I I get this vibration going through my body every time I walk in there and then this is how many years later now this is we're going on 30 years later yeah. and I still feel it uh, but uh, you know I had a powerful experience in my whole career uh, obviously coming to New York just magnified that because I looked at it as a second career in, in some ways uh, mm-hmm. leaving Edmonton obviously and the legacy that we left there but coming to New York and trying to do something that hadn't been done in at that time 51 years was and not unbelievable opportunity, but scary as hell. Right. A lot of expectations. And of course, I think the biggest thing for me is, you know, riding that wave from winning the President's Trophy, losing the playoffs, which the Rangers did, to missing the playoffs and being lower than a snake's belly and then all the way up to the Stanley Cup the third year. So, you know, um, I think that is one of the things that made it so special is knowing what it felt like to be a loser in the city and knowing what it, the magnitude of, of that feeling of the fan base and the expectations and only to turn around and come up the other way. So I, I, I felt both ends of it as an yeah. athlete. And I think that's when I go to the garden today, I can appreciate the athletes that are going in there trying to win. And I can appreciate the feeling and the expectations and the, and the pressures that go along with it. Yeah. You talk about expectations. Obviously, it's very different to like I look myself, I come here as a nobody. You come here as a superstar. Talk about expectations. Was that nerve-wracking to take that on or just exciting? Or? Uh, it was exciting and nerve-wracking because I felt that I was coming um, with a lot of um, knowledge about what it took to win, what it looked like, what winning looked like, uh, what it's supposed to feel like in the dress room, in the organization, um, the culture that has to be created in order to win. So I, I had a good understanding of that, but... What I didn't factor into it, I wasn't going to be able to talk about it um, when I came to New York. I felt I could come here and kind of use those examples with my new teammates, but they didn't give a hell what ha- happened to me in Edmonton. <laughs> the only thing they cared about was what we were going to do together, right. what was going to be the experience that we shared together. And so I, here I'm thinking about, you know, all these things that, you know, happened in Edmonton with Wayne and the leadership and, and all the defeats and the disappointments and then followed by success. The only thing that was going to happen here in New York is we're going to have to kind of go through that whole process ourselves and and feel the sting of losing, feel the sting of of disappointment, underachieving, all the things that to go along with losing, and then how are we going to fix it? You know, what's how are we going to create the culture that it takes in order to win? And so, but I did feel it, uh, even though um, at the time I was 31. But in hockey terms, one of the articles that was written about me is I was actually a 62-year-old <laughs> hockey player because I'd played so many games and so many playoff games. Wow. I, thought, I was a 62-year-old person in reality, so I was got washed up. Fair point, I was a washed-up has-been coming to New York at 31. I mean, you won six times. How, how Can you compare it winning five times in Edmonton and then come here and, and all the build-up and how long, it, you know, talk about 50 years and, and then being able to win? Like, 
Do you do you rank them or you can't? Obviously, it must yeah, be like very who's special. Your favorite, who's your favorite child? But yeah. uh, I think more importantly is, you know, I, I was from Edmonton, Alberta. That's my hometown. So mm-hmm. I have family, friends. We were all original six fans. I was a Boston Bruin fan, Bobby Orr. All my aunts and uncles were Toronto Maple Leafs and Montreal Canadiens. So we grew up with the original six team. So to, for Edmonton to get a NHL franchise as a right. kid growing up there. This was a, you could we couldn't believe it to be honest with you. I know we had the WHA when in the seventies when they started the second league and all that, but to have an NHL franchise in Edmonton was just you you can't imagine the excitement that went there, uh, and then to be a part of it as a hometown boy right. was was incredible. Um, but like everybody else, it's a dream come true. You set your whole life uh, on a journey to try to win a Stanley Cup. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we did it a million times in the driveway. Mm-hmm. The game-winning goal and then game seven, right? I mean, that's what, we, that's what you do. And then to be able to have that opportunity. And then the, what you really realize after uh, you win a Stanley Cup is, I don't want to say it's a hollow feeling, an empty feeling, but what, what you feel is that what you really miss is the interaction and the journey along the way um and that's not you don't think about that when you're trying to climb the mountain Mm -hmm. you're just thinking about you're trying to get there but in reality when you think back about it it was all about the um the journey and then to go on and win two three four and five what became more exciting is that sharing it with guys that hadn't won yet Mm -hmm. younger guys coming in veterans coming in that never won a stanley cup and being able to uh, you know share that same kind of feeling and create those same kind of brotherhoods and bonds Mm -hmm. Uh, with new teammates, it never got stale. It never got old. It was always every September was this whole, uh, you know, idea of all the possibilities of what we could, and you start that same journey again, the one that I just talked about. Right. But then coming to New York, completely different. And now we have an original six team that hadn't won in fifty-one years. All the disappointments, three generations of fans that had never seen a Stanley Cup, let alone, you know, see some great playoff. They got close a few times in the early seventies, and of course. Uh, with the with the, uh, the great Rangers '79, but only met with disappointment. So, being able to be a part of that yeah. um, process for me um, at that stage of my career was um, was just incredible. Huh. Going back to your point on uh, not being able to say anything or or kind of bring the port those lessons over from Edmonton. Like, was that something you felt, or was it just that the guys well, it terrified me? Uh, because uh, then, uh, so I'm sitting on all this intellectual property, if you will, <laughs> because of all this winning that uh, we had done sure. and all the things that it takes to win and all the things that it uh, takes not to win. How was I going to kind of convey that? How was I going to share that? And I just realized, it just you know came to me that the only way I'm going to be able to do that is through experiences and then explaining and teaching along the way. Right. But there no, was no okay. fast forwarding that. You can't fast forward that kind of um education and building culture and, and right. winning you have to experience it you have to feel the disappointment you have to feel the sting you have to know everybody you got to get you yeah. got to get them you got to get to know the players you got to yeah. know where, get to where they came from and yeah. what motivates them and what inspires them and so it's a process and mm-hmm. um you know i was lucky enough to come here when i did that have amazing players you know mike richter brian leach kovlev zubov yeah. it's not like the rangers didn't have a good team but how do you bring it all together yeah you know how do you get the core pieces and then the and then the the complementary pieces the role players to come in there and and uh, and uh, really embrace their their roles on the team that's it's it's not easy winning as we have uh, as, as you've seen as well it's maybe hard to rank the cups then but if you look at the teams i mean you play with so many incredible players hall of famers is there one year that sticks out to you that like that team throughout your career was kind of the best team well, it, 85 is considered the best team of, of the century because our record, we had a really good record. I think we were 16 and 1 or 16 and 2 in the playoffs. Wow. And that team, I think 87 <laughs> team, uh, it, I think 87 team was, was probably more talented, but we didn't have as good as a record um, in the playoffs. Um, you know, we brought in a guy, Kent Nielsen, who might have been top five offensive players, talented players that I've ever played with. Uh, we got him at the deadline. Rio Rodzelena, a, a Finnish defenseman that the Ranger fans know very well, mm. came in and was a, was played with Don Jackson, a big, strong, solid defenseman. Uh, we had a lot of depth on that team. Um, 
But in 90, we won on sheer guts and grit and determination. Uh, you know, we had lost, you know, Wayne and Pekoff and Grant and a lot of the players that had been there. And then we brought in a lot, a lot of young guys. So we still had Yari Curry, who had a lot of asset ticking in, Kevin Lowe, Glenn Anderson. You know, we got Craig Simpson that played with Annie and I. So that cup was kind of one more on sheer experience and just grizzle. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was, and everybody thinks that was, should have been my favorite cup because we were able to win without Wayne. And I'm going. I was just going to ask if that meant more. No, like a more no, bigger challenge. No, no, it was actually disappointing that he wasn't there to share it again. Because, <laughs> you know, we're brothers in arms, right? Yeah, yeah. So you know, we're all obviously disappointed when he left. But I, I felt more proud of the uh, guys that were left over that banded together um, under the circ under tough circumstances and didn't roll over and 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 surrender to the circumstances. We fought hard and we felt we had an obligation to each other and to the team and everything else, even though was, we were pissed off, right? Yeah. But um, that, was, that was a great cup. And, but, they're all, but they're all special in their, in their own, because they're all take on their own meanings in different ways. So for 15 years, you know, I was driving out to practice center and tons of photos all over the rink. Uh, but to me, there's two photos that stands out to me and I'll never forget them. It's a photo of you about to lift the cup here in 94, mm -hmm. that pure excitement I see. Yeah, yeah. And the second one is first game back at the garden after 9-11, you wearing the firefighter hat. Right. Those are the two, like of all the photos, and there's so many big moments, but right. those are the two that really stands out to me when, when I think back of the training center, because it gave me so much inspiration, but also where the city's been. And um, mm -hmm. can you talk to us a little bit about that game, first game back at the Garden after 9-11? Well, hockey is a game of emotion. It's what um, brings people into the team, into the players, into their journey. Um, and the game has to be played with emotion, and it evokes motion. Um, it, it evokes motion 30 years later, walking to the garden for you and I, and, and for you more recently. Um, but that's what makes it so special. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you think about, you know, that in your career, the moments that define certain events, like you're talking about, uh, coming back the first game, and of course, 9-11, and um, is that the one you're talking about, 9-11? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. October 7th. Yeah. You know, that was one of those uh, moments um, where you could be proud to be a New Yorker. You could be proud mm -hmm. to be a Ranger because of the way the city banded together um, mm -hmm. under some incredibly trying circumstances. And, you know, everybody at that moment wasn't quite sure what the right thing to do was. Uh, nobody wanted mm -hmm. to make a mistake and, and seem insensitive to the lives that were lost. Mm -hmm. uh, decisions had to be made. Leadership had to stand up and and make hard decisions. Um, and uh, that game kind of brought all that into focus in some ways. And, um, you know, years later, with the, to your point, that's, you know, one of those iconic moments for me personally in my career that I uh, was a part of it uh, and mm -hmm. could represent something yeah. much bigger than, you know, the Rangers or myself or, you know, you're really representing the city at that point yeah. uh, in, yeah. and many different other things as well. So. Yeah, that I mean those, you know. But then you look back at some so many other pictures that have a million stories, Absolutely. right? Just like that. Yeah. But every one somehow or another conjures up emotion one way or another, and that's why the sport is so great, and that's yeah. why. Exactly. You, there's so many photos up there, big moments, but those are the two that kind of they do something to me. Yeah, yeah. When I mm. see them. Yeah. Like your excitement and the importance and how much it meant to people right. winning 94, but also October 7th, 2001, the first game back. There's something happens to me every time I walk by those two photos. Mm -hmm. and that's well, I why think, I, I never think, forget I think them. the one where you're talking about when I'm about to lift the cup up, you know how difficult it is to win any time, let alone in New York and all that. But when I came to New York, I thought I had a good understanding of how passionate the fan base was here. And to me, that really excited me because coming from Edmonton, that's it was such a micro focus in on the team, and um, of course having Wayne and the, the, all the expectations that we started to create because of the a great team we had. And to come into New York and and 
I was so excited that it meant something to play for the Rangers, and there was a there was an intensity to it. There were expectations that because to me, I think that's fuels. It should fuel the organization. It f- sure. should f- fuel the players, and um, that was a great sign. And then three years later, riding that wave of excitement and disappointment all the way up to winning. I knew the impact that it had on so many people here and how hard mm-hmm. it was to get there. So, I mean, you know, you're, lift, you're, get, you're about to lift the cup, not for yourself. You're about to lift the yeah. cup for yeah. millions of New York Ranger fans around the world that had been waiting so patiently. So there was a lot of uh, gravity to that moment that not just actually lifting the cup, obviously. Yeah. And a lot of people refer to you as the captain because of your leadership skills. And th- this is actually something I reflect in, on meeting you over the years, like you're your energy were you always comfortable in leading even as like a teenager or is that something over time you just learned how to lead yeah i think it's something that happens over time i think you know i saw great examples of leadership throughout my career uh i saw great examples of leadership when i was a young boy watching my dad who was a um, a teacher uh, got his master's degree in education and taught kids but he also coached uh kids and um into the junior level and I, I was a stick boy when they won their first national championships and I watched the way my dad talked to these players these young impressionable 15 to 20 year old players that were trying to make a career and how he galvanized a team and created the culture mm. that was uh you know all for one and one for all um the team always bigger than 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 the individual and how do you sacrifice uh, and how do you leave your ego and all the things that you guys know about um so I saw it and mm. I saw it work and there's many ways to the one way, as they say. There's many ways to, to win. I only knew one way, and that was to be inc- completely inclusive and making everybody feel completely responsible. And anything other than their best was never going to be good enough. And how do you convince players? And normally when you win, as you know, normally when you win, there's players that are overqualified for the positions that they're playing. So how do you keep them happy? Because everybody's you know mm-hmm. trying to get a better contract, and if they get more goals and more points – we're obviously going to get a bigger contract and all the dynamics that come into it. But in the end, everybody's got to, you got to convince everybody that this is what we need from you. Yeah. And that's why some players can't play in, in winning organizations because it's too, too demanding. Hmm. Uh, and, it is and, hard. And that, that's a great point because when you've been on winning teams, um, great teams, everybody accepts their role and they take pride in their role. Even if, like you say, they want to do more. They want to do the best they can in this role, and they accept it. And I feel like every time you go into the playoffs, it becomes clear. During the season, sometimes you there's a lot of, you know, I want to play more, I need more points. But in the playoffs, when it just becomes about winning, mm-hmm. I feel like you can sense it in the locker room where guys just, okay, I'm going to really accept my role. It's it's not about points anymore or ice time. It's about just winning games. That's when the sport becomes beautiful in some ways is that, you know, you spend 80 games trying to kind of mold that kind of mentality and get everybody in their positions and in their roles and and um, acknowledging the, the sacrifices those guys are making, but also celebrating their contributions, no matter how big or how small. I mean, mm-hmm. that that takes a lot of time, takes a lot of trust, mm-hmm. takes a lot of work um, to get to that point. But when when you do, that's what makes our sport mm-hmm. or team sport so beautiful is that. You know, you can act, you can actually create that kind of all-in philosophy, and doesn't always work. Yeah, obviously, but uh, that's 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 the end game. That's what the goal is. Yeah, you, just any uh, role players stand out like guys that just absolutely nailed it. Uh, maybe if they're even overqualified. I could go back thirty years until I f- and tell you amazing stories. But if you just look at the team here in New York, you know Eddie Elchuk, a former fifty goal scorer that was relegated to a role player. Yeah. Um, you know, but amazing guy, um, 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 amazing team player, um, never, I'm sure was disappointed at times, uh-huh. obviously, but never showed it. I was always su- in support. Um, you know, the d- list just goes on and on and on. Yeah. Glenn Anderson, the hall of famer, uh, yeah. became, came to New York and was kind of became more of a depth player at times. Uh, you know, so those are the kinds of examples that when you talk about, you know, guys that uh, accepted a different role than perhaps they've had in the past in order to win. Yeah. And they realize that, um, you know, this is, and I think that the sales point is, all, you know, the stage is always big enough for everybody when you win. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, and that's the kind of what you're trying to get across to everybody is that, 
you know, let's just figure out a way to win, and then we're, the stage we can all stand there and take and share in the right. uh, share in the accolades. Yeah, you talked to her about pressure. Like, did you enjoy being the guy? Like, having that pressure. Obviously, coming here was a lot of pressure, but also the expectations that you as a as a superstar face every day. Did you enjoy that? Well, I never looked, I never once in my career thought of myself as the guy. Um, I, I realized that um, I was never kind of the player like skilled like Wayne or Lemieux or some of the great players that played the game. I was more um, reliant on the players around me. And so my, I think my, <laughs> maybe my best skill is, uh, is galvanizing the team. And of course, uh, you know, you got to perform on the ice. And of course, there's going to be added pressure if you're the captain and the face of the franchise. And, you know, you're out front, mm -hmm. good or bad, like I witnessed in 91, 92 when we won the President's Trophy. And of course, it was disappointment when we lost. But then I was still out in front of it when we missed the playoffs the next year mm -hmm. uh, and then have to absorb that. Uh, what you really realize is that uh, the most important thing you can do in a leadership role at that particular time is just cons consistency. You can't be a good guy when things are going great and then turn off the faucet mm -hmm. when uh, things go bad. You have to be, have a, take a tact of who you are, not only for the press because the press is such a huge part of um, playing in New York, but also f so the players can read you. Uh, you're consistent in your behavior. You're consistent in your in your um, in your approach in your philosophy and with that comes a certain calmness um, uh, and a big part of uh, leadership and um, and those are just kind of the lessons that you learn along the way and certainly learn that being here in in New York when the lights were the brightest <laughs> yeah. and last time we were hanging out we, we talked a lot about the mindset of playing in the game and like today you know a lot of players and teams that have psychologists who to help you be in the right place mentally. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't that common back in the 90s. Like how much did you work on your mental approach? You talked about being calm, even though there's a storm going on around you. How much effort did you put into that? Well, I realized early in my career that uh, I was spending 99% of the time on my body trying to get in shape and be as strong and quick and fast and skills all I could. But I realized that I would, there was a bigger opportunity to um, win the mind game. Um, how could you be tougher mentally? Um, how could you expand your mind to be able to perform under pressure and not freeze because of the magnitude of the moment? Mm. Uh, what are those life lessons that uh, allow you to do that? And so you try to surround yourself with people that uh, understand that. And um, back then, um, sports psychologists didn't really kind of exist to, like they do today. Um, back then, it was probably more considered a weakness if you needed something like that. Sure. Um, uh, it's a learned skill like anything else, um, and um, and I think it's for the better. U ultimately, you know, we've seen now where um, where, where it's really benefited players um, that don't have that uh, skill set, don't know how to breathe under pressure, um, and um, and I became just fascinated and interested just because I was always trying to figure out how I could become better in every way, um, better skater, better pick, better shot, better mm -hmm. understanding, better teammate, uh, you know, how can I uh, coach, tell me something and, know, and then remember it and go implement it on the fly, not two weeks later when it had to be ingrained in me. I mean, that I was trying to be better in every way. And certainly the mental side of the game for me became uh, paramount. Uh, I wanted to win the mental game every time I stepped on the ice and I knew I could because um, because I was paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think that um, they're just, you know, we could do a whole other show on that itself, <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know, it can, yeah. And it really is an ongoing process, like much like how much time you spend on the ice, skating or lifting weights, like, because I feel like every year something new happened, your experience is a little different, you might know more, but also you have more baggage so you need to keep working on this mental, you know, approach. It's not like, yeah, experience gives you more knowledge, but it's not always easier, I feel like, having more experience. Sometimes you, it means more pressure or maybe more expectations. So I felt like throughout my career, you, you definitely have to work on it mm -hmm. every year, mm -hmm. every, every month, you know, and, and, and just deal with your own emotions and to, to make sure you're, you had a clear mind. Well, to, to your point, when you get more experience, there's also more heart, heartache that goes along with <laughs> yeah. it. There's more scar tissue. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, then, then, there's, then you start to think about what the what ifs. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, soon you start to think in along those lines. I mean, obviously you're 10, 10 moves behind the play. Uh, um, so I, yeah, there's a, there's, there's a lot to be learned uh, there. And I, I found it fascinating to myself and mm -hmm. you just find people that um, can help you in that regard. And uh, all the things you learned throughout your hockey career, is there anything that you feel like really helped you now when you moved on for hockey and, and, and obviously a very different life, but is there any lessons there that stick out to you that like, I'm going to bring that into my next chapter in life? Um, all of it. Hmm. I mean, there's, no, there's not one thing that happened in my career that isn't relevant to what's happening in post-retirement. Uh, from a very early age, you learned a very simple lesson. You fall down, you get back up. If you just take that alone, you could do a thesis on that alone hmm. in, in life. Uh, and, but we learned that from, you know, very early in age. Um, I, I, I think for me, the... The grit, the grind, the determination, um, problem solving, um, all the things that uh, are so critical to winning, um, for me anyways. Um, but I don't think there's a thing that, an experience that happened to me in hockey, good or bad, that didn't shape me in a way and prepare me for uh, post-retirement. And, um, and mostly... I would say that uh, I recognize that uh, surround yourself with good people. Yeah, I was right. lucky. I was lucky and fortunate enough to play with some amazing players, but more importantly, some amazing people with high character. Mm. And um, and you realize that uh, there's a lot of things that you could, and a lot of areas that you could venture into, but doing it uh, and wading into carefully and making sure you're surrounded with with great people and ident being able to identify great character people is 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 incredibly important so the life lessons that uh, came yeah. for me that have um, helped me in post retirement are are, are, are incredible you are you still very competitive or are you kind of more i don't know for me at times i get very competitive now but i feel like i, I loosen up a little bit <laughs> <laughs> try to like ah it's just a game but deep inside it's like no it's just not just a game oh, if yeah. i play tennis with my brother or whatever but yeah uh maybe it's healthy that i'm not as extreme um but how do you feel now like the uh, I, i'm super competitive i, I remember uh, my dad uh, you know kicking our asses when we were kids and all different card games and checkers and chess and <laughs> you know, any kind of game that we played and never relinquishing and, you know what I mean? And um, so when I do find myself playing anything now, I, if I'm going to play, I, I want to win. You want to win. And yeah. whether it's golf now or whatever, um, it, I think it's just, it becomes more habitual than anything. I, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's a bad thing mm. to be competitive. But for me, probably more so uh, the reason why is because it makes me, focus if i go out and play a game of golf it's easy sometimes to say why well, i don't have it today the exercise for me now many years later after being retired is that okay you don't have it today but how are you going to get it today right. and not give in to the situation and i think that to me is, is is more important than whether i have it or don't have it in anything whether you just don't feel good one day and i don't feel like getting up and going to the gym today no get up and go to the gym and then figure it out but yeah. having the discipline and, and the the wherewithal to not give in to the situation is another one of those life lessons that you're talking about right. that you learn there, there, you know you got to show up you, there's no there's no there's no there's no there's no way you're not showing up so if you're going to show up you might as well figure out a way to, to show up and and do the best you can and and more importantly that's where you're talking about the mental side of the game Right. That's what mm -hmm. you learn. You, you learn that, that mind over matter under any circumstances, because I used to wait for the league to kind of fall down. And like we talked about in Vegas, yeah. I used to wait for the league in, in like in, around Christmas, January, the dog days of January, February, when it was kind of you couldn't really see the end of the, and the weather was bad and everybody was a little tired and banged up. You know, that was a time to, for me that I would double down because I knew there was an opportunity there. Mm -hmm. Winning the mind game at those particular times on every, any given night and taking advantage of the team's other softness or they're not quite there mentally. And, um, and in the retirement, it's the same thing. I don't want to lay down. I don't want to take give in to the situation in anything I do. I want to, I want to battle my mind through it. You're involved with so many different projects now with charities and businesses. What, what excites you the most right now? 
Uh, spending time with great people, for one. Mm -hmm. uh, helping kids. Uh, I have an amazing board with amazing people, high character uh, board members that uh, want to help and inspire kids to be the best they can and give them access and opportunity to anything that they choose. Um, I think that, to me, is an incredible way to give back. Um, um, and, then, and then just doing amazing um, entrepreneurial things. The performance brand is, we think of the literal term of Game 7, but the, really what Game 7 is about is the journey that we talked about. Right. Because everybody in life has had a Game 7 moment. And how do you, what, what decision did you make when you were faced with that? You know, what was it that allowed you to perform? Mm -hmm. uh, did you leave it to chance to perform when it was, mattered most? Or were you, did you prepare your whole life for yeah. that moment and arm yourself yeah. with the tools required in order to perform? And uh, so we're very excited cool. about that. And the other one is uh, with the uh, 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 health and wellness concept called Honeycomb, which we're galvanizing, you know, the top brands, modalities. Think of Little Ely meets health and wellness in big 50, 60,000 square foot boxes that will encompass mind, body, and spirit to, to, uh, to help uh, people to start their own journey or take someone that's already high achieving health and wellness yeah. person and to even take it to another level. So right. we're excited about that as well. How much, uh, how involved are you in, in each one of these? That sounds like. That is, uh, that's uh, those, you know, yeah. my partner, I, Isaac Chira from the, from the Chira, the yeah. amazing, uh, family here in the city uh, we partner on both these right around the same time just before COVID or just through COVID yeah so it's been interesting to start uh, two startups uh, under right. those under that kind of uh, pressure but uh, we're, we're close to both now and it's been an amazing journey actually awesome well, that's an exciting 24 yeah you know to, to launch that and and talk about game seven I, it just made me think about like when you say game seven like there's two different ways of going about it and I always kept telling my teammates, like, if you look at it as an opportunity and get that positive vibe around it, game seven, mm -hmm. instead of like, oh, it's a must win or, or we're done, you know, it, it, it just creates such a different emotion in your body, like to find that excitement going into a game seven with the, the, op the feeling of opportunity instead right. of a must win. Yeah, if you don't like how you're feeling, change your thoughts, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, that, that is true. And, and, and you're right. I think uh, one of the things that's interesting about starting up a, a brand like Game 7 is our, we did an app survey. One every two people in North America know what Game 7 is. Wow. So immediately we got all this uh, uh, brand equity. Um, we got 100 years of content to work with. Uh, but more important, to your point, um, you know, what is it that, uh, you know, really kind of inspires people? Mm -hmm. And what what does game why does game seven resonate so deeply with a, with someone that doesn't even not even particularly even a sport fan but will go somewhere and watch a game seven mm -hmm. because you know it's 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 life's what do they call it reality tv yeah. In, in, yeah. in in a way sure uh, so i think for us uh, you know we are going to tell these stories about people that have made great decisions not just in sports but beyond sports eventually life's games okay. eventually in the yeah. literal term to start with because obviously yeah. everybody knows that but we'll you will get out to musicians i mean yeah. there's amazing stories about musicians that you know um, their life journey to get where they were uh -huh. uh, politicians businessmen philanthropists mm -hmm. um, i mean it extends to everything and i think once we do that and we ask you know the world what's your game seven moment uh, that's interesting how do we how do we how do we inspire you or educate you for those moments that uh -huh. will ultimately come your way. And I think that's what the whole brand is uh, gonna be based on. There's a, um, a much deeper, richer conversation that takes more time sure. to delve into those moments of that. So I think, and then having sports psychologists mm. talk about the pressures and how do you deal with pressures? What are, the, what are the release valves that you're talking about? How do you go into a game seven and not think about failure? Mm -hmm. Or maybe do think about failure. Cause me personally, I allowed myself to, to the night before laying in bed to see myself losing and what it would feel like and what the reaction would be to losing. Because I think if you're trying to always push that out, that takes a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. So I allowed myself to feel that way. But then ultimately, as the game got closer, I would push that out and then I'd start to fill myself up with, with all the positive. And then ultimately, um, what you realize in the game seven is that you concentrate on execution. Yeah. And so yeah. once you start to concentrate on execution, you don't have to worry about all the things that are drifting into your mind because you only have one focus, singular yeah. focus, about executing your game plan and then what your responsibilities are on the team. And so it becomes very clear 
and you're not clouded with, you know, the outcome. Um, and I think those are tools that people can actually use in many different Absolutely. aspects of their life. Have There's, you had any uh, Game 7 moments uh, in business? I've had many Game 7 moments. <laughs> <laughs> many Game 7 That's moments. That's a loaded question because entrepreneurship is, I think, filled with them. But, it is. Uh, yeah. It is, which it makes it exciting. Yeah. Especially if you're um, trying to – I like building things, whether it's something in the yard or something in the house or fixing something. I, I mean, I, that appeals to me. But I think in business, um, um, that, to me, uh, when you're trying to create something that we – we are with Game 7 or even Honeycomb, um, it's the people that uh, you're spending time with. They're working towards the same yeah. goal and focusing in on it uh, and asking ourselves, I mean, what, what's going to be our Game 7 moment oh. in this particular yeah. endeavor, right? Like, yeah. what, where is that kind of where we just kind of, we're right there on the edge of, yeah. you know, things going one way or another, <laughs> the critical decisions that need to be made in order to kind of uh, uh, tack your mm -hmm. way through it. Um, uh, that's exciting to me. Yeah, absolutely. I think that in business and, you know, outside of sports, there's people that really thrive in like the peacetime. And then there's people that really thrive in the trenches. Right. And uh, like having superb characters around who are very comfortable in the discomfort is everything. To your point on execution. Um, yeah, because it, it's almost inevitable that those moments come. Well, that's what's really interesting when you take a team of uh, hockey, 20 players in hockey, right? not everybody's going to look at the same thing the exact same way. And you're going to have different players that react differently to different situations. But trying to figure out how you're going to react so I can anticipate how you're yeah. going to react under certain situations um, is important for the leadership and the, and the coaching and, uh, of, of the team. So you can, yeah. you, can, uh, you can anticipate it. Because I played with guys, to be quite frankly with you, that were great players there that froze in, in the most critical moments. Mm -hmm. And... and not the fault of their own, but it just, but you know, we, we knew, we knew that kind of what to expect of that player. So, yeah. you know what I mean? We knew what positions to put him in until you, you put people in position to succeed, not to fail. Yeah. But understanding those things, I think is, is more the important conversation of, of, uh, of, so of understanding. It becomes the extremely important and as a leader of sports or business to, to know your team, to know yeah. who, who is going to be comfortable in hmm. these different roles, right? We used to do this thing called the Thomas concept um, because it, you would self-identify your own personality traits. Mm -hmm. And so when you'd really kind of separate the room, there'd be like four guys in that bucket and four, three or four guys in that bucket. And you could look around the room and you could see the diversity of the way people think on the team. Because if you had the whole team of real deep analytical thinkers, and you had 18 of them, and you had a kick-ass coach that's coming in and screaming and yelling at these guys. They weren't gonna. That was not gonna go well for them. Right. So matching up the philosophy yeah. of the coaching and the teaching with the kind of personnel on your team is super important, right? Mm -hmm. So, and the coach has to understand you can't treat everybody the same because he doesn't accept criticism or praise different, the same as everybody else. 100%. So it becomes very uh, a big part of it's, winning. It sounds obvious, but it, it's absolutely like more ignored than it's embraced well i think we're getting better at it now yeah. organizations are getting better at it now there's more of a deeper understanding or there's more attention to being paid of the human element mm -hmm. of uh, winning um and on teams yeah. um, and i for me i think it's the only way i know uh, to connect with my teammates on a much deeper level um so uh, when i had to be hard on them they didn't take it personally sure i can't come down hard on somebody uh, for one reason or another, and then he, he's saying, saying to himself, he doesn't like me. Right. He just He's just out to get me. No, mm -hmm. that's not time. Because sometimes in the middle of the heat, I don't have time to explain why I'm telling you to do this. Right. I just need to sh shut the F up and <laughs> right. do what you're supposed to do. Right. At this time, we'll talk about it later, yeah. but right, I don't have time right now. Yeah. <laughs> but if he takes that as a negative, then he's going to sit on the bench and he's going to sulk. I don't need him to sulk at that particular right. time, right? So yeah. there's... So understanding how to treat everybody is critically important. And how to establish your own point of view and moral compass so that trust is there when you do. And that's what takes the time. Yeah. Uh, that's what takes yeah. the time to forge those relationships. Yeah. yeah. Great teams have that. And you have the ability to, you know, really be honest face mm -hmm. to face and there's mm -hmm. no bullshit b b behind closed doors it's like you, you, yeah. you keep that open in the room and you're able to tell people what, what's going on and, yeah. and accountability 
Yeah. And, all I, I, and I think it's probably getting harder now because nothing's a secret anymore. Back, back in the days, whatever happens, it's behind the closed door stays behind the closed doors. Now it, it doesn't yeah. seem to be that easy. So I think the trust level is harder now. But ultimately, to your point, I think the teams that really have broken through that kind of mistrust and are really kind of, you know, um, loyal to each other, I can't, I can't see it happening without that. Yeah. I, I think you're just too reliant on everybody. You're, you just have to be able to trust everybody and to have con- those honest conversations. Yep. And in theory, everybody says, yeah, we're doing it, but are they really doing it? Well, that's the difference. Like, like, there's so many shortcuts. Like Everything that gets attention is like, do this better or hack this. or. But the stuff we're talking about is like the connective tissue that takes time. And it actually takes the work, not just saying you're going to do the work. Right. Like, oh, I want to join this team because they do these things. But if you don't commit to that, you know, and, and but get- it is, uh, you know, getting to know each other. And that's why you can spend a full training camp. Let's say we have a lot of new players come in. Mm-hmm. You have a full training camp. You start getting closer and get to know each other pretty good. But it's not until you have a night out with the boys <laughs> and guys really loosen up and you actually start to get to know each other. That's when I start to feel like you, you're becoming a team. At first, you're just 20 soldiers mm-hmm. trying to get ready for season. And then when you have time together away from yeah. the rink, yeah. you actually get to know each other as well, people. That's why, that's why the Halloween party was the best party of the year <laughs> because it came at the perfect time because everybody could get out of their own professional ideology of what they are, what they should be, and really kind of bring it into the circle and really relax. And everybody could kind of see the personalities emerge and, you know, get together with the, you know, the wives and girlfriends and better haves or whatever, right? And just bring this whole energy into the circle because ultimately, um, you know, the extended families around the team are just as important as the 20 guys sitting in the dressing room. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to, you know, uh, it's just... It's fascinating. That's why I was able to play 26 years. <laughs> I'm sure you loved it. Yeah. I loved it. I'm sure. that, uh, I, one of my questions here, we kind of skipped it, but what was the best part, in your, in, in your opinion, playing in the other show for that long? The endless possibilities. I love the... I love playing hockey. I loved um, all the things that everybody talks about. Coming to the rink. I never thought of it was a work to work out in the summer. I, I love the putting in the time, the effort that was required. I knew what I needed to do to be the best I could be. And it, it would, that never really felt hard for me. I mean, it was hard because I pushed myself, mm. um, you know, beyond the limits uh, to prepare. Um, but I love that part. But I think when I look back now, maybe the, the, the best part about tw- 26 years is I thought I was in the hockey uh, business playing 26 years, but I was in the people business. Of course. That, that's what really kind of emerges in retirement 30 years later. It's mm-hmm. all about the people. It's mm-hmm. all about relationships, you know, and how you forge those relationships and how you go on this journey together. And, and that's why culture becomes so, I know it's an overused word, but it's underestimated the power that the culture can have because ultimately the, what you're talking about, there's a lot of guys that come with bad reputations that I've seen come into our culture um, and change uh, because the enormity and the gravity of what and how, the, how much power was built up, if they weren't able to change, they got every opportunity to change. And they made mistakes, but we didn't give up on them. Mm-hmm. We gave them the opportunity to self-correct and, and come back to it. And then ultimately they would decide, uh, the culture would decide if they could stay or not. Nobody had to say this guy's not a good guy. He he, and and to be honest with you, there were guys that came in that couldn't do it because there was too too much that's expected of them. They they couldn't change. They didn't have the the character to change. They didn't have the character to uh, think uh, about people around them, not only themselves. But um, that, to me, I think to answer your question, starting every September and going on that journey. To your point, even if there's the same team, but there's four different guys, five yeah. different guys. Mm. Those four or five different guys is 20% of that team. That changes the dynamics dramatically. How do you bring them into the fold now? You can't rely on the past successes, even if you've won a Stanley Cup, coming into the next year and think it's going to be the same. It's not. It's never going to be the same. What's going to be the new motivator this year? What's going to be the insp- inspiration this year? Right. You know, Those are the things that keep it fresh so you can play 26 years because it never becomes dull. Every year is a new sense of purpose, a new sense of opportunity. Right. 
And the culture is, is not a thing that you just achieve and then have forever, right? It changes too, the, right? The principles of the culture, in my opinion, there, there's certain principles that are um, un, non-negotiable, sure, obviously. But I think what changes in the culture is um, the the I'm not going to say the motivation because the inspiration of that what that team takes on. Uh, I, 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 I I think motivation sometimes gets lost in, because it's more compliance, right? Yeah. You want to inspire people to motivate themselves. So it's a different kind of concept, but it's fascinating. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> love it. Well, listen, I'm so happy you came on yeah. Club Third today. I, That's I loved, it. We're done? I mean, we, we can keep, we can going. keep going. I don't, I don't want to hold you for too long, but I, I feel like, um, you know, meeting you over the years when was uh, the first time you guys met um probably well, spent a couple of years uh, with uh, with the rangers as an right. advisor so i saw yeah. the yeah. team a little bit here and there and mm -hmm. uh, traveled a bit but i think it was probably uh that was early on in early my on career you yeah. were around and and but every time i i see and, and back to my earlier point like your energy and how you approach people is something mm -hmm. i always admired and and your energy um, and uh, I just look forward to you know have more opportunities to hang and and hopefully watch more music and and, yeah. and continue oh, yeah. talking so because it's, it's been great. Uh, I, I went on stage in uh, Hilton Head with uh, Hootie and the Blowfish way oh, back yeah. when they were became big and yeah. uh, so they invited right after we won the cup in '94 actually uh, at the old post office in. Uh, There's just a big hockey guy, Hilton, right? It's huge. So Mark, come on up. It's kind of a college <laughs> yeah. bar back then. It was kind of a. They get up there and they uh, give me a tambourine. So there I am, banging the tambourine against my. And they, they gave you a plaque, <laughs> Mark Tambourine Messi. <laughs> so I'm happy to join your band. As oh a yeah, 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 join yeah. our band. Absolutely, you yeah. should. That's yeah. good. It's good to know. <laughs> I'll be on triangles. Yeah, triangles. Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah exactly. Yeah. Jay, where are you putting you? Triangles. Oh, triangles. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we got that covered. Then. The least Perfect. critical position. <laughs> Well, listen, Mark, uh, all the best to you. Happy Thank New you. Year and, and good luck with the launch of Game 7. And um, yeah, I'll that's see fascinating. You down the road. Yeah. Can't wait to see what that it's looks great to like. Be with you guys. Yeah, thanks awesome. so, so much for hanging with us. Let's go, Rangers. Let's, Let's go, go, Rangers. Rangers. Thank you to Mark for uh, joining us here today at Club 30. Um, oh, that's a lot. A lot that I really enjoyed. Uh, you know, about leadership, the mindset, the music. Takeaways, Jay? Same. I mean, we, I just really appreciated how present he was and uh, his approach, you know, post-hockey to life and business. Um, I mean, he kind of wrote, he did write the book, uh, wrote a book <laughs> on leadership, right? Like, that's what he's known for, the captain. And I think the way he's been able to uh, take this really, uh, cerebral approach into team building and business is is why he's so special. He has this, and you can feel the energy right yeah. when he's here. And and he talked a lot about, and he kept coming back to the people. Mm -hmm. You know, and as a hockey player, team sport, you kind of take it get, for granted. Uh, yeah, a yeah. little bit, a yeah. little bit. And now when you're away from the game, uh, personally, I feel, you know, I have an opportunity now to create my own team. Yeah. Um, and the importance of it to have great people around you yeah. it, it and be intentional so about it right yes but even that uh, you know earlier um in this year when we had a rod on he was talking about you know you only do people business with people that you like or and you trust and and you kind of take it for granted which is like oh here's an idea but you don't think about prioritizing the people like the you know who's your team who's your personal board and mm -hmm. i thought that was an interesting um, kind of a comment that he made about his board in New York and how he's really been uh, focused on surrounding himself with the right people. Uh, but definitely a lot of great takeaways for us. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. And I look forward to more conversations and, yeah. and really get deep. We are so know? privileged to be like able to do this. You know, <laughs> I know it started as like a kind of a, you know, crazy idea. Let's see if we, we like doing this. But sitting here with legends like Mark and... Uh, it's like a, it's you know it's I'm just so grateful to to be able to be in this seat. Obviously, I, I mentioned before the show that he was one of my childhood heroes. But to get to know somebody, I think it was like halfway through the interview, and I was like, actually, that's Mark Messier, and we're talking about <laughs> stuff that I enjoy. You know, it's 
we're we're lucky and and uh, it's, it's really nice to be able to share it with Club Thirty listeners. Yeah, no, this is exactly why we started the show, and uh, I just want to wish everyone a great start to twenty four. Yeah, um, just go out there and, uh, and have fun, surround yourself with great people, and uh, we're gonna see you down the road. But, Absolutely. Uh, Enjoy 24, everyone. Yeah, happy uh, new year. Let's go. Happy new year. Uh, we hope you liked the episode, and we'd love your continued support. So please like, subscribe, follow, uh, and we'll be back with more content for you soon. Thanks. All the best, guys. Bye.